George, have you ever wondered if the people who run laundries are having sex in the back room while people out front are cleaning their clothes? Never. Not once have I wondered about this. It must be convenient, though. You do your sex stuff, and then you can throw the sheet or tablecloth or whatever was under you right to the washer when you're done. Or you could just wait till you get home, do your sex stuff, and then use your own washing machine to clean out the sheets. That can't be right. Who would own a laundry machine when they have an entire laundry? Why wouldn't they? Do you think people who own restaurants don't have food at their house? No, obviously. If you own a restaurant, you probably don't have a fridge at your house or a stove. That's ridiculous. No, it's not. You already have those things at your business. What are you going to have them at your house for? So, you're telling me a woman who owns a clothing store doesn't have her own clothes? No, she has her own clothes. Well, exactly, Joe. At the store. That whole store is like our closet. Have you suffered a recent head injury? Dude, you really think people who own stores don't use the things in them? Sure, but you're suggesting if a guy runs a furniture store, his house must have no furniture. It probably doesn't. What are you talking about? Look, I don't know what you're not getting here, but it seems pretty obvious. You think anybody that owns a bowling alley has a bowling alley at their house? Of course not. A bowling alley is not like a store or restaurant. You can't possibly believe a guy owns a McDonald's restaurant and he uses that as his personal dining room. Ah, oh, they all do it, George. I'm telling you, that's how crematoriums got started. What? Guy owned a pizzeria and used that as his own personal kitchen. One day he was sleepwalking and went to make some lasagna. Accidentally, he put his grandpa in the oven and boom, crematoriums were born. This has got to be the dumbest conversation we will ever ever have on this podcast. Don't be silly. It's only been 158 episodes. I think we're more than capable of being stupider than this. Welcome to Does This Still Work? The podcast looks at old movies and asks, Does this still work? I'm Joe Dixon. And I'm George Romacca. And today we're discussing My Beautiful Laundrette from 1985 and some historical context. First, podcasty stuff. One podcasty thing, I've seen this title on our upcoming episode list for, what, three years? Oh, really? I had always assumed Laundrette was a woman's name. <laughs> Whoa, you know, it's interesting. I guess that's... <laughs> I guess that's not that ridiculous, really. You can reach us at dtswpod at gmail.com on Facebook, Letterboxd, and Counter Social. Please tell your friends about us and leave five-star ratings everywhere. You can pick what we watch and get extra per-episode content by funding us on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash dtswpod. Now, Joe, take us back to 1985. Hold on a second. Wait a minute. So if you thought this is uh, the name was uh, My Beautiful Andre, it was a woman... But you you described the movie to me last week as it was a, a love story. Did you, and then you once you read it, did you go, oh, it's not my beautiful laundry. Isn't a person in it? Because I had to check to make sure that it was streaming before we announced that it was coming up. Right. So I saw the blurb for it and was disillusioned about it being a woman's <laughs> name. Okay. All right. In this history corner, we are going to look at some facts about the United Kingdom in 1985, since that's the film setting. First up, there was an event known as the Brixton Riot. It occurred in the South London neighborhood of Lambeth. It was the second riot there in four years. This unrest, which went on for two straight days, resulted in injuries to 43 civilians, 10 police officers, and the death of 29-year-old photojournalist David Hodge. The following year, an award called the Observer Hodge Photographic Award would be created in his honor. Fires destroyed 55 cars and one building. In the chaos, as usually happens, some people took advantage. Thus, there were 58 burglaries and good old looting. Which honestly, if nobody looted, can it really be a melee? I say no. Per Wikipedia, this furor was sparked by the bastards of the Metropolitan Police shooting Dorothy Sherry Gross while they were seeking to arrest her son, who they believed was hiding in her house. He wasn't. She was in bed when they busted down her door, guns blazing, and shot her because, you know, cops. The police shot her in the shoulder, which paralyzed her from the chest down for the rest of her life. Since we mentioned their photojournalist, let's see what The Observer says about this. The Observer is a newspaper published only on Sundays, 
and a sister publication to the left of center Guardian. The UK Observer is the world's oldest Sunday-only periodical, having first published in 1791. Headline, George. Priests hit out on jobs plight that led to riot. The Anglican priests did a both sides analysis blaming policing, the rioters, and the social and economic conditions for the turmoil. I will put most of the blame on the cops myself. Why? Quoting. Paula Belsham was lying in the bath at her home just off Brixton Road at 4 p.m. on August 30th. She was alone in the house. Suddenly, the front door caved in under a sledgehammer blow. This man in jeans holding a sledgehammer kicked in the door of my front room. Then a second man rushed in, pointed a gun at me, and crouching down like they do on TV. I started screaming, and a third guy grabbed hold of me, pushed me to the floor, and held a gun to my temple. I couldn't believe it. I was so scared I wet myself. None of them wore uniforms. You wouldn't guess they were police. They showed me a warrant, and I stopped screaming, and they threw me my African dress to cover me up. One of the dogs bit one of them, and they threatened to kill it with the sledgehammer. I begged them not to. They examined me internally while there was a man in the room. Apart from asking where the heroin was, they hardly said anything. They ransacked the place, pulled up the carpet and the leno, split open some stuffed toys. One guy even put his hand in the goldfish bowl. They left after an hour. End quote. That was the second raid on that woman's house. The article also relates what I took to be a form of stop and frisk, where the cops randomly decide you look like a criminal and pat you down. Utterly disgusting behavior. Mm -hmm. I ask you, George, when you've got law enforcement behaving as if they were street thugs, does that build up or tear down any respect a person could have for cops? Especially in this case, where the law is mostly white, and the people being treated like criminals are not. Is this really a question you're asking me? Yeah, why not? Because if you're a conscientious human being, it makes you not respect the police at all. If you're a right-wing fascist asshole, you're fine with this. <laughs> yeah, well, right-wing assholes aren't really people. I take that back. Don't take it back. <laughs> Folks, Google court okays barring high IQs for cops. Yes, that's America, but I dare say it's a problem in a lot of places. The brightest people are not going into law enforcement. And in this country, the courts actually encourage that. You want smart, dedicated men and women in blue? Turn on the TV. If you want them in real life, we've got to elect politicians up and down the ballot who will make police behavior a condition of their funding. We pay for these fuckers. They need to act like it. Back to the 85 Brixton riot, or rather the results years after the fact. In 2011, Ms. Gross died of kidney failure. In 2014, the police apologized for the wrongful shooting after an inquest jury concluded police absolutely bungled the whole situation in 1985. Well, that only took 29 years. Only. Moving on, we had other riots in the UK that year. One happened in Lutton and was known as the Lutton Riot. This upheaval is what we know UK rights best for, football hooliganism. Of course, when I say football and the UK, I mean soccer. In the sixth round of some match I'm not going to mention because I don't give a shit, all hell broke loose. The stadium was trashed. Fists, bottles, and even chairs were thrown, and all 47 civilians ended up in the hospital, as well as 31 officers of the law. And all, there were 31 arrests made. Because nobody was white, the coppers decided a club would do the job so nobody got shot, nobody got paralyzed, nobody got killed. George, what is it with sports, fans, and riots? Is it a guy thing? I say guy because I don't think class or race plays as much as a factor. I can't think of a women's sport event where they started smashing shit because their team lost or won. You might want to ask sports types about this because I don't get it either, Joe. Okay. I got some more hooliganism business from 1985. These both happened in May. Quoting Wikipedia, on May 11th, a 14-year-old boy is killed. 
20 people are injured, and several vehicles are wrecked when Leeds United football hooligans ride at the Birmingham City Stadium and cause a wall to collapse. On May 29th, that's my birthday. Hey, that's right it is. The Hazel Stadium disaster occurred when Jupiter's fans escaping from a breach by Liverpool fans were pressed against a collapsing wall in the Hazel Stadium in Brussels, Belgium, before the start of the 1985 European Cup final. This resulted in 39 deaths, 34 arrests, and 600 injuries. It also got English clubs banned from European competition for five to six years, depending on the club. And I guess that's it. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. The UK wasn't done with rioting. September of 1985 saw the Handsworth riots. October saw the Toxteth and Peckham riot and the Broadwater Farm riot. 1985 was a year of social unrest in the UK. I blame Margaret Thatcher. She was a terrible prime minister and she was matched in America by Ronald Reagan, a terrible president. I don't mean to make this political. I hated them as people as well not just their policies. Before we head into the film, I do have to discuss British Pakistanis, even if none of the lead actors playing Pakistani were actually Pakistani. For one thing, at least according to one source I read, the people of that era would have referred to themselves as Asian, not Pakistani. I don't know how accurate that is, but I felt I should mention it. I should also probably say, this film likely wasn't watched by much of the community when it was first released. Folks are more likely to be watching Bollywood movies with singing and dancing, not British movies with homosexuality and interracial sex. Also, plenty of people probably wouldn't have cared for a young woman pulling up her top. You wouldn't know it the way conservatives bitch about immigrants, but these communities tend not to be terribly progressive. Their descendants might be, but the first generation is seldom packed with left-wingers. Not that liberals didn't have their criticisms of this picture. Poet Mahmoud Jamal, at the time, said this about the movie. Reinforced stereotypes of their own people for a few cheap laughs. He thought the film portrayed Asians as money-grubbing, sex-crazed schemers. No better than how Jews would be depicted by anti-Semites. Harsh. And finally, it's not made a big deal of, but cousin marriages are also portrayed in this film. It was, and still is, a fairly common practice in some areas of the world. Hell, in America, one out of every 1,000 marriages are between first cousins. In the 1980s, they did research in the English city of Birmingham and found 50 to 70% of all marriages within the Pakistani community were between cousins. I'm going to be judgy here and call that disgusting. And nature seems to agree since you double the chances of your kid having birth defects if you hook up with a relative. Children born to Pakistani parents related by blood had an autosomal recess condition rate of 4% compared to 0.1% for European parents who weren't cousin fuckers. Autosomal recessive conditions include cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, and Tay-Sachs disease. None of this sounds like fun to me, but I guess many people think it's worth the risk. Anyway, before we end this segment, I want to quote from British journalist Anushka Kastana. Growing up in the 1980s in Northwest England, people like me were often the target of immigration fears. Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, Sri Lankans rolled together in the most derogatory moment under the label Paki, we're the bad guys. It was we who were stretching public services, taking up housing, and causing churn in schools. Decades earlier, it had been Russians, Jews, and the Irish. So I guess some things never change, which explains Brexit. Anyway, George, let's talk about my beautiful laundrette. Okay, then. This was directed by Stephen Frears and written by Hanif Qureshi. Stephen Frears has done a number of films, but this is our first outing with him, and we will be seeing his high fidelity later this year. We sure will. Yeah. His other works I've seen are Hero and Sammy and Rosie Get Laid. I remember Hero, I barely remember Sammy and Rosie except the scene where a bunch of characters get laid. So it was true to the title. Stephen Frears looks a little bit like Rodney Dangerfield. He does! My God, I had thought the same thing. Uh, Hannah's work I am not as familiar with at all. So for awards, this was nominated for an Oscar for Best Writing Screenplay Written Directly for the Screen. And that's it. Blurbs. 
IMDb says, An ambitious Pakistani Briton and his white boyfriend strive for success and hope when they open a glamorous laundromat. That is not entirely accurate. He's definitely uh, uh, ambitious, and that's definitely his boyfriend, but them striving together to open that place, uh, uh, it's a bit more complicated than that. Well, it is more complicated than that, but this is a blurb, not a summary. True, but it just gives, I think it just gives the wrong idea. It sounds like they were a couple opening this place up together as opposed to yeah. what it actually is. Amazon says an ambitious young man takes over his brother's failing laundrette. What? I don't know what fucking movie they watched. <laughs> says with the help of an old friend, they turn it into a video and neon palace rivaling some New York clubs. What? Amazon go home. You are drunk. <laughs> I think that whoever wrote that listens to this podcast. <laughs> Why? Because he got everything wrong? What do you suggest? Because it's so not even wrong that it's funny. <laughs> My God. Wow. Well, just wow. I, I have no words. To quote Luke Skywalker, every word of what you just said is wrong. <laughs> and HBO Max says a young Pakistani man, Gordon Warnacki, and his street punk lover, Daniel Day-Lewis, struggled to succeed in running a failing laundromat. Okay. Close enough. I'll take that one. Characters. Omar. Pakistani Ralph Macchio <laughs> is happy to be wherever he is, doing whatever he's doing with whomever he's doing it with. Played by Gordon Warnacki. This is the only thing of his I've seen. And this is his first movie credit. Then there's Johnny, Omar's childhood friend, who is also a fascist street punk. Played by Daniel Day-Lewis. Well, unlike Gordon, I've seen Daniel a few times. I've seen him in There Will Be Blood, Lincoln, and Phantom Thread. For two of those, he won an Oscar, Will Be Blood and Lincoln. Plus, he's also won a Best Actor Oscar for a film I've never seen called My Left Foot. As of this podcast, he's the only man to win Best Actor three times. And I've seen him in Gangs of New York. So, those are the only two we're going to talk about for the cast section. Everybody else will be peppered into the summary. The film opens with an eviction. Johnny and his fascist buddies are squatting in a building owned by Omar's uncle. If you're paying attention or watch the movie twice, you'll see someone that I'll introduce later as part of the group of evictors. Some tenants put up a fight, but Johnny and his roommate go peacefully. When you first see that scene, who did you think that guy was that Johnny's helping out of the building? I was thinking that was Omar. Oh, really? Because the frickin' blurbs, right? Right. I know he's part of the gay couple, so the other male should be his boyfriend. But they open with this, and we don't see Johnny for a while. Yeah, I assumed that what must have been a boyfriend that he had after he broke up with Omar or whatever he and Omar previously had. That's what I had presumed. And the way the guy's moving, I assume he's sick. I'm just projecting all this on there. None of that's in the picture. So, yeah. so I had to fill in the blanks. And that's the impression I got. This is a lover that he, he was with at that time. The guy was sick and maybe even died later. And that's why we don't see him anymore. We won't see Johnny again for a bit. Now we focus on Omar and his dad, a drunkard who cares about his son, but sees college as the only path for him to take. Papa Hussein, played by Roshan Seth. I saw him in Mississippi Musala and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Yep, he was the Kali Ma Rip Your Heart Out guy. Mm-hmm. I know him as Dalsim from Street Fighter, that horrible video game adaptation. Hmm. Huh. Papa wasn't always like this, and I'll just get some exposition out of the way right here. In his younger days, he was a respected journalist in Bombay. He was and is a socialist. When Omar was a child, he was friends with Johnny, and Papa was a good mentor. Eventually, Johnny fell in with his current friends, who are a bunch of fascist punks who cause problems for non-whites. Papa's heart broke when he saw Johnny in a march through town, not unlike what we were seeing during the Trump administration, except the bastards hadn't figured out that they can recruit more if they wore khakis and button-downs. And we weren't uh, shocked. Yeah. Papa calls his brother and asks if he's got a job for Omar. As luck would have it, he does. Do you think it's odd that Papa wants his son to go back to school, but he's begging his uncle to get him a job? Why? Because he needs money to go to school. I guess they aren't rich, so maybe he doesn't need the money to go to school. I guess that may be reason. Okay. It didn't translate to me. What he doesn't want is him hanging around the house. Yes. Omar heads down to his uncle's parking garage, where it is 25 pounds a week for parking. 
He looks at one of the cars and is assumed to be a thief by the financier of the family, Salim. Salim is where everyone gets their money from, and he gets it from drugs. And he was in that group of people evicting at the start of the movie. Yes, that's right. He's played by Derek Branch. Don't know his work, but his character has a right idea. If you want to make money, sell drugs. That'll do it. Then we meet Omar's philandering economic philosopher, Uncle Nasser, played by Saeed Jaffrey. And we don't know him from anything. Nope. Nasser offers his nephew a job washing cars before his side piece Rachel arrives. She's played by Shirley Ann Field. I didn't realize this while watching, but I'd seen her before. She was in a movie called Peeping Tom. Peeping Tom was considered the psycho of British cinema. I mean, Hitchcock's psycho. Not that the movie was psycho. Either way, I didn't like it. It's also possible I saw her in a guest appearance on Murder, She Wrote. The parking garage has a bedroom for some reason, so we can hear what serves as Nasser's pillow talk as Rachel rides him, as he puts it, like a niner. What's a niner? Good question, Joe. <laughs> it's really not. I'm sure British know exactly what that is. Omar is all too happy to listen at the door. Omar is all too happy to be doing anything at any time. It's like the actor was so stoked to get a role that he couldn't hide his excitement while playing the character. <laughs> he does seem rather pleased with everything, doesn't he? Yeah, he seems like he's on helium. <laughs> Nothing gets Omar down. He does get nasty later, though. Later, Nasser and Rachel meet Omar in what Nasser calls a high-class bar. Omar's uncle doesn't appreciate Omar talking trash about his father. Nasser has him there to tell him how the economy works. In this damn country, which we hate and love, you can get anything you want. It's all spread out and available. That's why I believe in England. Only you have to know how to squeeze the tits of the system. Squeeze the tits of the system. That's a certainly uh, interesting turn of phrase. Yep. Rachel translates this as saying Nasser wants to take care of Omar. He starts by taking a wad of cash and stuffing it into Omar's chest pocket. Sometime later, we see Omar washing some cars. Again, he seems way happier than the situation calls for. Nasser asks him to do some accounting work for him, so he goes to do that. Because he's an accountant also. <laughs> Who needed a job washing cars? Sure, why not? He's an all-around guy, that Omar. He can do it all. This lasts well into the night. He's still working when Nasser and Rachel leave. Before the goodbyes, Nasser hints at a promotion, lends Omar his car, and invites Omar to his house to hear about it. And Rachel is, I'll say, overly familiar with her goodbye kisses. <laughs> As Omar is leaving to go to Nasser's, his father tries to warn him about getting involved in the family, while giving him grief for dressing up for it. He tells Omar that Nasser is a crook and that he should go to college. But you just told him to go work there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the part I, can, I don't understand. He begging the guy on the phone, hey, please hire my son. Son, go work for him. Oh, don't get involved in the family business. Where did you just send him? Go for him to work somewhere else then, if that if meant what you said. At his uncle's house, his aunt, Nasser's wife, not Rachel, introduces him to other aunts and longtime no-see cousins. Salim's wife thinks Pakistan is the greatest place on earth. Every day in Karachi, every day, your other uncles and cousins come to our house for bridge, booze, and VCR. Way to date your fucking movie. <laughs> booze isn't outdated. Omar's cousin Tanya intercepts him on his way to see Nasser, asking him to meet her later in the games room because she's bored. She's included here because if she's going to show us her tits as explicitly as she does, mm. the least we could do is mention her. Played by Rita Wolf. The tits are nice. I can't say much about the acting roles because those I have not seen. Omar opens the door to Nasser's bedroom, where the menfolk are laughing at a story Nasser is telling about his brother, Omar's father. As the menfolk size Omar up, Tanya is flashing her tits at him through the window, managing to not be seen by any other man in that room. Well, one does, but he doesn't say anything. Omar meets Tanya in the game room, where she tries to get his dick wet. He's resistant to her efforts. She says Nasser is too cruel to people in his business dealings. She also doesn't like that he's sleeping with Rachel. 
Salim's wife asks Omar to drive them home because Salim is drunk. Under an overpass, a pack of feral British racist fascist punks start assaulting the car. I'll introduce one of them, Genghis. He's one of Johnny's pack of fascist miscreants. Kind of a British knockoff of Ethan Supley. Huh. Played by Richard Graham. If IMDB is correct, I last saw him in Phantom Thread. I also used to watch a British show about retired police detectives being put to use on cold cases called New Tricks, and he was in one of the episodes. And I've seen him in Titanic and also in Gangs of New York. Omar sees another punk standing off, not participating, and gets out of the car to go talk to him. <laughs> That's Johnny. Omar acts like the other punks don't exist and tells Johnny to call him. You know, happily. Did you or did you not find that an absolutely the most bizarre scene? Yes. These guys are like threatening the car, hitting on it, and also, and he's like, he sees this guy over there, like, is that, is that someone I know? Gets out of the car. As easy as breezy, no concerns at all. The guy's do not touch him. And he just walks over to Johnny. Hey, Johnny, how's it going, man? When I first saw that scene, both, even though I'd seen this movie before and the first time I saw it, I thought, he's in with these guys or something? Maybe he's once a gang member? Because he is so comfortable yeah. in that moment, not concerned at all about being touched. It's like he's got toxoplasmosis. Which is what? It's a parasite that infects the brain of mice that makes them lose their sense of fear, huh. so they'll get, like, eaten by other things. Huh. It's like he has that. <laughs> it's something's going on. It's weird. Omar gets home and finds his dad trying to undo his pants to pee out on a balcony. Omar does it for him while dad fills us in on Johnny having been a little fascist and then goes into how racism is aimed at them. Omar is just excited about the laundrette opportunity. Another scene of this was really weird to me. His dad needs to go out on the balcony to pee. They have a bathroom. Mm-hmm. Next day, Nasser gives Omar a tour of the laundrette. They pass a guy who will be on the phone there, always telling his girlfriend that he's totally not going to see that other girl again. Telephone man is a swollen John Cusack. <laughs> Do you compare all the actors to someone else? <laughs> every, every actor description is some uh, uh, American actor. <laughs> Only if it... Makes sense to do so. A swollen John Cusack with the telephonic charisma of Mr. Waturi from Joe vs. the Volcano. Played by Gerard Horan. He also made an appearance in New Tricks. He was also in Sammy and Rosie Get Laid. I have no memory of his character getting laid. He was also in The Singing Detective, and I saw that. And this was his first movie credit. Nasser describes the place as a toilet and youth club. Never mind the people inside, you know, doing their fucking laundry. <laughs> we see some of that business cruelty in how he handles a child who is drying some sneakers. Nasser was expecting Omar to sweep the place up. Omar asks his uncle to let him run it. Nasser agrees and says revenue minus basic rent is profit for Omar. First, his dad calls begging him to do any sort of job. First, he's cleaning the cars. Then he's suddenly the accountant. And now they're going to have him running a laundry. That kid moves fast. They really put him, pushed him up the ranks. Mm -hmm. Well, it's only an hour and a half movie, Joe. <laughs> Sometime later, Omar is sitting in the back room when Salim comes to visit. Immediately, Omar, and for the only time ever, for anything, Omar is second-guessing himself. Huh. Thinking he made a mistake taking on the job. Yeah, that is really weird. It's like literally the next scene. Oh, let me take the place I can run it. And the next scene, I don't know what I'm doing. Yep. It's really abrupt. It's a really weird key change. Salim offers some financial help in the form of a run to a place near the airport to pick up video cassettes. Omar does that, and then goes to deliver them to Salim, who has just gotten out of the shower. Goes to get dressed and tells Omar to make himself comfy. Explicitly, Salim says, hey, watch something if you like. So Omar grabs one of the tapes and puts it in. Nothing but static. While he's waiting, he calls Johnny's dad and leaves a message. And then Salim comes in and loses his shit for putting one of the video cassettes in the VCR. He puts Omar on the ground and stands on his face for a bit without making any of the Bruce Lee faces. <laughs> Salim says Omar is like the white assholes who use <laughs> racial epithets, that he's a disappointment to his family back home, and tells him to fuck off. All that because he put in a tape that he brought that you told him to do. Mm-hmm. 
And by the way, I didn't understand this in 1985 when I first saw this film, and I don't understand it today. Is there some money you can get out of video cassettes that have nothing on them? It's just static. We will find out in a bit that Salim is smuggling drugs in various ways. So you think that's what's in the cassettes? Yeah. The video cassettes are just cartridges holding the narcotics. Okay, I did not get that. It just made no sense to me. And I still, if that's the case, don't tell him to play the damn tapes. <laughs> Why does he do that? Good question, Joe. He could have just said, okay, put these video tapes on the side and go watch something else. Go talk to something, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And so he just specifically says, oh, go play something. He does it, and he goes, don't use those. Well, how am I supposed to know? The next day, Omar is squinting through a black eye as he pulls up near the laundrette. Genghis and crew are outside. He asks them about Johnny, and they tell him to go back to where he came from. And again, he does not seem particularly scared of them. Nope. Which is, again, very strange, because they are threatening. He's like, eh, where's Johnny? Or maybe he thinks Johnny will protect them, so they won't put a hand on him. Nighttime, Omar is desperately trying to trim his father's toenails. It reminded me of the spa scene in Dumb and Dumber. Hmm. While he does this, his father is trying to call Nasser to get Omar out of whatever he's doing that resulted in his black eye. Omar doesn't let him make the call. When the phone rings, Omar excitedly goes to answer, cutting his father's toe in the process. It's the call from Johnny that he's been waiting for. He tells him to meet at the laundrette. And Papa Hussein is a bit of a drama queen about the whole thing. You've amputated my entire foot! <laughs> Bullshit! <laughs> <laughs> At the laundrette, Omar tells Johnny that he wants to be partners with him in this venture. Well, not so much partners, just more like to have Johnny do whatever Omar wants when he wants it, starting with kicking some young punks out who are beating on the payphone. When you say young, you're not kidding. They are kids. Yeah, they're kids. They're like little kids. They barely come to Omar's chest. Mm -hmm. You could have did this, buddy. They're just children. Because I watched this twice, I think that there's a bit of a dom-sub dynamic between Omar and Johnny. Mm -hmm. I think they both get off on Omar telling Johnny what to do. Could be. Johnny shoves those kids right into Salim, who is coming in to drag Omar to the back room. And he tries to keep Johnny out, but Omar just lets him in anyway, so Salim just does his thing, which is to say that he's sorry for the black eye and that he's got another run for Omar to make. And at that pickup, he finds an associate of Salim's with a fake beard with packets of narcotics hidden inside. Omar sees this and goes, you know, I'll do a bright thing. I'll put the mask on, too. Won't that be funny? Not thinking like, well, what if the cops see you wearing this fake beard and decide to investigate? Since, as we know from the history corner, they stop and frisk you. And that beard looks fake, especially on him. Mm hmm. Omar hurries back to excitedly tell Johnny about this. Johnny seems to want to be turning his life around on a more straight and narrow path. What Omar wants is for Johnny to use his connections to sell the drugs that he found in the beard to fund his vision of what the laundrette could be. I just realized this. I wonder if there's some subliminal subtext there about him having a beard, because that's what his cousin's going to be. At least it seems like it. No. No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that is way too deep. <laughs> Omar delivers the drugless beard to Salim to the amusement of all his guests. Salim takes the beard to inspect it and then dismisses Omar, who ballsily asks to be paid for the delivery. But Salim isn't playing that game. Now, he doesn't take all the drugs. He already takes out some. There's still some packets in there. The way Salim is manhandling that beard, I don't think there were. But you know what? It actually makes more sense. <laughs> So Omar and Johnny go to a club where Johnny makes quick work of selling the dope. And for some reason, Omar has to watch him do it. Mm -hmm. Which, wait, maybe it is a sub-dom thing. So why does he need to be there? He's not doing anything. He's just standing there. Yep. Then Omar is at Nasser's, asking him to tell stories while the cousins massage their father. He tells his uncle about his sound business decision to hire someone to help him. Nasser wants to meet Johnny, and Omar thought to bring him along. Tanya makes a pass at him on his way out to get Johnny. And Nasser wants Johnny to help him evict tenants that aren't paying their rent. At night, Johnny and Omar are talking about their vision for the laundrette, which leads to them making out in an alleyway. And this is the first time that it's explicit that, oh yeah, they're, mm. yeah. You could forgive Omar in the beginning for like not wanting to maybe, you know, put his dick in his cousin just because she's his cousin. <laughs> but apparently that's not the problem. <laughs> 
<laughs> Except I'm not entirely certain that he wouldn't be willing to do it. He's one of these get along guys, so maybe he would still be able to pin it in her, you know? Yeah. He's no Bonnie and Clyde. He's no Clyde. And as you and Kit were talking about, you know, you don't always have to be into the person in order to get into the person. True. Before they can get too far into that, they hear a commotion around the corner. Johnny's other friends, the pack of fascist punks, are winding up to do some damage to the laundrette. Johnny gets physical with them to stop them. One of them gives him a spiel about how they brought the Pakistanis over to work for them. And that's how it should be. You know, the usual racist garbage. <laughs> that just ends. Goes nowhere. And then we see Johnny and Omar making out in a car. So it's just an interruption to their making out. Just a racist spiel in the middle of a makeout session. <laughs> These two are the most not, I don't know what word I should use, is not careful, closeted gay couple I've ever heard of. Careless. Careless, yeah. They're really, I mean, they can be caught at any time. Maybe that's part of the thrill. Maybe. But they are not careful at all. Johnny mentions Omar's father, prompting an exchange where Johnny expresses appreciation for all the help that Papa Hussein gave him when he was a child and frustration from Omar at how Johnny's later behavior hurt his father. Johnny wants to put that behind him. Before driving away, Omar sees Johnny climbing a rope into a window. Yeah, apparently where he stays. I mean, I know their options are somewhat limited, but if you're with somebody, you care about them, and you just made out with them, wouldn't you at least be a little concerned that they're spending their night sleeping in a abandoned building? Would you like, I, we need to fix this or do something? He is concerned. But he doesn't do anything about it. Yeah, he does. He tells his uncle. When? Well, because he, all right, we'll get into that. Yep. The next day, Salim is driving by the laundrette and sees Johnny up on a ladder working on a sign when the fascist punks also just kind of hanging around, but not really causing any trouble. They just hang around there a lot. Yeah, it's very weird. For some reason, Omar comes out to stuff some money in one of Johnny's pockets and gives him a hug. Then Johnny licks Omar's neck. <laughs> please catch us. That's all, that's all that the whole behavior says. Please, please, oh God, catch us, catch us. And then he just walks off. <laughs> one of the punks picks up a piece of two by four, then menacingly approaches Omar, who just retreats inside which is strangely sufficient to stop a racist from committing violence. Hmm. I guess racists don't know how doors work. <laughs> well, they are British. Did you ever see that video that was like a, a conspiracy theory that Donald Trump doesn't know how to open a door? No, but it sounds funny. It's great. <laughs> yeah, because there's lots of video of people opening doors for him. He never touches the door. I don't think he knows how a fucking door works. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Salim is wondering to Nasser where Omar and Johnny got the money to fix the place up. Nasser assumes it was a government grant. Salim tells Nasser that Johnny is a bad influence on Omar, just as Johnny arrives to assist Nasser. Uh -huh. Nasser takes Johnny to a building where there is a poet who hasn't paid rent. Johnny asserts to Nasser that he is not going to hurt anybody. Johnny does end up having to physically remove the guy from the premises, but otherwise, no, he doesn't actually hurt him. And as Nasser is tossing the poet's belongings out the window, Johnny brings up that this might not be a good look for a Pakistani businessman. Nasser, perhaps naively, asserts that there is no question of race in the business world. Which is probably the funniest line in the movie. <laughs> yep. Then Nasser offers for Johnny to stay there in that room rent-free, acting sort of as the building manager. And he says, Omar says you don't have a place to stay. And so he offers him the room. Ah, oh, I missed that. Okay. I missed him saying that, that it was Omar's idea. Yeah. At night, Johnny is putting finishing touches on the signage for the laundrette. He worries aloud to Omar that Salim is on to them. Then he recruits one of his fascist buddies to help him carry part of the signage up. And he does. He does get a weird look from Genghis, though. <laughs> like, Genghis is like, the fuck are you doing? He's like, I don't know. <laughs> Racists can be very accommodating sometimes, especially when it comes to putting things up ladders. Hmm? No. Oh. <laughs> it took you a while there, buddy. No, it didn't. <laughs> it just, I'm not going to tell the black guy that he can't make a lynching joke. <laughs> if anybody can, it's you. So go for it. 
We're two thirds of the way through the movie, and it's the grand reopening of the laundrette. Omar wants to wait until his dad gets there to open the doors. Amazingly, there is a crowd standing outside, waiting to do their laundry, like it's an Apple store. Yeah, it is really bizarre. None of that. Did you notice some of the crowd are not carrying any laundry? They're just rushing in. There's no, they don't have a bag. They have nothing. It's like, what are you going to the laundry for? The only guy who has the excuse for that is the guy that's going to occupy the payphone. The telephone. Yeah. Really, they did a good job fixing up the place. There's classical music playing. All the machines are new. There are comfortable looking places to sit. And the walls are painted with watery waves. Which Johnny could not have possibly done all this by himself. Shall I open the champagne, then? Didn't I predict this? You did, man, you did. This old stinking area is on its knees, begging for clean trousers. The jewel in the jacks here, South London, this place will be. Omar gives Johnny a bit of a guilt trip about his fascist days. And as Omar is winding the story down, Johnny starts undressing him and kissing him. woo <laughs> Johnny says there's not much that he can do to make up for those days except to be here with him as he is now. Ah. Uh. And that's fair. I guess. I mean, you can't, like, go back and take back your fascism. <laughs> you can just go forward and not be that anymore. And do some serious fucking. Well, as they start to get their fucking on, Nasser and Rachel just waltz into and through the place, talking about their relationship and how Nasser wishes he could do more for deadbeat children like Johnny. <laughs> His word. Nasser and Rachel start making out. And then Omar notices that they're there through the back office window. He and Johnny quickly start getting dressed right as Nasser comes into the back room. They lie to him and say that they were just waking up because they were all just buggered out tired from fixing up the place. What do you make of Nasser's response to this? Do you think he's on to them or he just doesn't care or what? I don't think he cares. Huh. I don't think he cares who puts what in who. After all, he's going to try to marry his nephew to his daughter. <laughs> so they start the music. Rachel cuts the ribbon. People flood into the laundrette, including the guy that's always on the telephone, so that he can get right back on the telephone and keep talking to his girlfriend, who should probably not be his girlfriend anymore. Uh. Tanya even arrives with flowers. She makes eyes with Johnny just like she was making tits with Omar before. Nasser is not happy that she's there, given that he's there with his side piece. Two things happen here. One, Nasser tries to convince Omar to marry Tanya. And two, Tanya rips Rachel a new one. Tanya, I do feel that I know you. But you don't. But you don't. <laughs> That's where it starts. <laughs> Not so much for her being her dad's side piece, but for living off of him, as she puts it. Nasser shuffles Rachel out of the place so that they can have a big-ass public breakup. Huh. Yes, we don't want to do this in public in the laundry. Let's do it out in the street mm -hmm. <laughs> where it's much more private. Inside, Johnny is doing some laundry while his former mates question his patriotism. Drunk Omar asks Tanya if she will marry him. She says only if he brings the money. He does this in front of Salim, who then goes and tells this to Johnny before he takes Omar outside to threaten him over the cost of the drugs that they stole to finance the place. Then Johnny just fucks off with his old friends. Huh. Omar finds Johnny in his room after a night out drinking with his old fascist buddies. He tells Johnny that he wants him to be at work. He tells them this in a way that expresses none of the affection between them. I want your work. Well, it'll be closing time soon. You'll be locking a place up and coming to bed. No, it never closes. One of us has got to be there. That way we begin to make money. You're getting greedy. I want big money. I'm not going to be beat down by this country. When we were at school, you and your friends kicked me all around the place. And what are you doing now? Washing my floor. That's how I like it. I get to work. Now, is that the same Omar we saw in the beginning of this movie? Or at any point? Or did he just change? No. The fact that that's not the end of their relationship is part of why I think they have a kind of top-bottom thing going. Uh. It just seemed another weird narrative change. Yeah. It would have been nice if it led up to this as he increasingly became more abusive and more, you know, telling Johnny all sorts of shit like that. But it just seems to come out of nowhere. Yep. And just abrupt, like, bam! I want you. That's the way I like it. You cleaning my floors. Remember when you used to beat me up? Well, now, who, look who's on top now. 
Sorry about the accent. <laughs> <laughs> no go there for cleaning me floors. You bloody, bloody fuck are you? Oh, I'm the big guy now. Ew. <laughs> okay, then. What's all this then? Stop, or you're going to end up rioting. <laughs> I mean, he ends that Omar saying to Johnny, I don't want to see you for a while. I have to take some time and think. All right, so Johnny goes into the laundromat and turns off the music that some guy was enjoying. Then Papa Hussein shows up, and he really looks down on their work in the laundromat. He asks Johnny's help to push Omar towards going to college. I don't know how long Omar took to do whatever thinking he needs to do, because the next scene is Johnny showing up at Nasser's to meet with Omar. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. They meet at Nasser's for a card game. Omar tells Johnny that his aunt has been mixing magic potions with which to punish Rachel and that they are working. Like, Rachel confirms it. Like, Omar is saying, yeah, she's getting a rash and, like, furniture is moving around and shit. And later, Rachel will be like, yeah, my furniture seems to be moving around a lot. And I've got this rash. Like, okay, magic works in this universe. Yeah, suddenly the supernatural takes over this film for some reason. In this one particular instance, I don't. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Omar tells Johnny that Salim threatened him and that they need a lot of money. Johnny says that London is full of money, but Omar needs to decide right now if that's how he wants things to be because accessing that money tends to require stealing it. So they do a burglary and steal some stuff that they can fence for some cash. Now it's Nasser's annual party which is the deadline that Salim gave Omar for having half the money that they stole returned to him. We see a lot of people there. Salim says that his wife is pregnant and that he's going to be buying a house and settling down. Omar is in attendance with Johnny. One of his other uncles has two more laundrettes that he would like Omar and Johnny to take over management for because they did such a good job with theirs. Tanya and Johnny slip outside for a little alone time. That alone time consists of riding a bike out in the rain with Tanya on the handlebars facing Johnny. Omar more than happily presents the money to Salim. And Salim says, never offer him money. He made the threat so that Omar would understand that stealing from him was wrong because he finances the family. The uncles helped Salim get where he is, and he's more than happy to do that for Omar. Omar just has to ask. Which, again, another tonal change. This asshole didn't seem like somebody would be willing to help Omar with anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, he pits his foot on the guy's face, for God's sake. Then Tanya and Johnny crash into the room on the bike, and before long, the whole Tanya-Omar wedding is off. Salim is giving Omar and Johnny a ride home as Omar pitches taking over those other laundrettes. Salim says he's in, because he needs some non-illegal enterprises, presumably because he's about to be a father. Then Salim sees Johnny's old buddies and runs one of their legs over. <laughs> Omar takes Johnny to go check out one of those laundrettes that they're going to take over, but Johnny doesn't really want to because Salim's there and Johnny's kind of pissed about the running over one of his old friends thing. Sometime later, Johnny is at the laundrette and Tanya shows up. She tries to get him to run away with her, but Johnny is, if nothing else, a loyal friend. Also, how well do the two of you know each other that you're going to run off? Good question, Joe. We also see all of Johnny's old friends skulking about, seemingly setting up for an ambush. But before that resolves, we have to watch Nasser and Rachel finish their breakup. Rachel shows him that his wife's magic spells are actually causing her a rash, and that's just too much for her, so she's out. He's so sad that he goes to visit his brother, Papa Hussein. Omar hasn't been there in some time, and I thought he was dead. <laughs> Why? Like when Nasser enters the apartment and he walks across and he's laying there. Oh, you think that's when he's dead? Okay. I thought he was dead. Like mm. Omar hadn't been there. He died. Mm. Nope. They do a little catching up and then go out on the balcony where they can see the train station. And right as Nasser is saying something about everything's going to be okay, he sees Tanya on that platform and then a train passes and she's gone. Improbably as that would be. <laughs> yes, here's what happened is that he assures his brother that, yes, th their children are going to get married. And then he sees his daughter out there and she's like, wait a minute, where are you going? And she's just gone. Yep. Salim shows up at the laundrette looking for Omar, who is still with his other laundrette owning uncle. Outside, the fascist punks get a good deal of damage done to Salim's car before he notices. 
Salim walks right into their trap and manages to get his ass good and beat the fuck out of. Do you remember one of the parts of that fight? What happened? Somebody's on the roof and he literally jumps off the roof to attack Nasser. What the fuck? What is this? Is a Bruce Lee movie? How does he do that? Do you never remember this? He got jumped no, off I, the roof. No, I absolutely remember it, Joe. I'm just, I'm with you. <laughs> it's like we've become a video game. Magic is real and people can jump off buildings that are perfectly fine and they can keep fighting. It's like, what the? Where is this? Where are we right now? Mm hmm. Johnny hems and haws for a bit, but eventually goes out to save Salim, even though he can't stand the guy. For this, Genghis kicks the shit out of him, even though Johnny is like, no, dude, I don't want to fight you. Okay. <laughs> Omar turns the corner, sees what's going on, and goes to rescue Johnny. The fascists scurry away for a moment, but then return so that Genghis can throw a trash can through the window. In the aftermath, Johnny is shaking and angry and beat to bloody hell, and still has the adrenaline pumping too much for Omar to be able to get through to him. But once he calms down, Omar is able to kiss his neck and touch him and hold him. The movie ends with them playfully washing each other off over a sink in the back room, splashing water on each other. The end. Before we get into whether this movie works or not, what did you think of that ending? With their shirts off and the splashing water on each other. Gay. <laughs> Yes, it was definitely that. <laughs> like, okay, your friends just beat you up. We have this whole incident and everything. And by the way, is anything actually resolved? No, nothing is. This movie just ends. <laughs> it just ends with a splash of water. I guess, well, Tanya's story ends. She has a new beginning, and that's about it. Yep. Her and her tits go off into the sunset. <laughs> her and her tits do go off into the sunset. It's true. Does it still work? No. And that's unfortunate. <laughs> like, it doesn't work because it wasn't a great movie. <laughs> it, a lot of things in it didn't make sense. A lot of things were just weird. The best thing about the movie is the gay relationship in it. Because it's not made a big deal out of. Right? They're just gay. They're just that. Like, that's just who they are. Right. Nobody says gay. Nobody points it out. They have to, like, not get caught. But that could all just as easily be we have to not get caught fucking in the back room, even if we were a guy and a girl, because it's his fucking uncle. <laughs> You're supposed to be opening the goddamn store. Not fucking. No, it's true. But the problem is it is 1985. And so England was very homophobic. So the idea that it wouldn't matter is ridiculous. But at the same time, that's exactly where we want these relationships to be. We want people to be able to be gay without having to say, I'm gay, without having that be the central, crucial part of the story. It can just be an attribute of a character instead of their entire being. It seems like they accidentally succeeded in that way before its time <laughs> in this movie, but they surrounded it with bullshit. <laughs> Well, that's just that the stuff surrounding it is racism and, and class consciousness and all sorts of stuff. So it's weird that the gay part is not a big deal, which in point of fact, it would be. That's the part that really doesn't make any sense. And I agree with you. If this film does not work, it is a mess. I liked it when I first saw 1985. I re-saw it. And it's weird because I looked at some of the reviews. Everyone, oh, it still holds up today. It's a masterpiece. I don't know what picture people are seeing. I thought it was a goddamn mess. I thought that the Omar character makes no sense half the time. But he's happy to be making no sense. <laughs> and to tell you the truth, I'm not sure about Johnny's motivation either. In fact, none of the characters really make any sense to me, except maybe Tanya, who wants to get out of the situation that she's in. After that, everyone is just sort of floats along until the movie ends. No one really changes much. Johnny makes a little more sense to me than, than maybe he should. Like, he was a friend when they were children, and he looked up to Papa Hussein. Right. And then, as children do, he fell in with a shitty crowd and ran with them for a while. But he also didn't... Like, I don't know if he saw into the car enough to know that that was Omar in the car in, when they were first banging on the car. Mm. He wasn't participating then, right? Like, he seems like he wanted to get out of that, and he found a way out of that. And a couple of times, he reinforces that he wanted out of that and that he's trying not to be that anymore. But why? What, what triggered that? I don't think you really need a reason to not want to be a horrible person. 
All you have to realize is that you're being a horrible person and then not want to be that anymore. Well, that's fine for real life. But in a movie, I need something. <laughs> I need something to clue me in on the why this guy suddenly decides that I'm sweet, not going to be this anymore. That Omar dick, Joe. <laughs> I also don't understand if he wants not to be that anymore, why is he still hanging around with those guys? At no point to just say, listen, dude, I don't think we should be friends anymore. Piss off. Go away. Stop bothering me. Stop hanging. He goes off with them several times. He goes off with them once. After the whole Salim says, hey, Omar's getting married thing, he goes off with them. That's the only time he goes off with them. The rest of the time, they are hanging out around the laundromat. Okay, maybe. I, I still feel like he's still hanging out. Like, with they're having a hard time taking no for an answer. But he never threatens to toss them out or anything. They're literally hanging on the laundromat and arguing about British politics with them. And he's like, guys, just get out of here. Leave me alone. I'm at work. Nothing. I don't know. I just, I didn't, I, I didn't understand any of the characters in this at all. Again, maybe Tanya is the only one who's made any sort of narrative sense. I, I the, the characters just seem to switch because the script says so. That is the movie. The script said so. <laughs> the script says so. I mean, I guess there's some importance to the, the father's affair. Although, if we're going to have that, then I would be... I, I, I want to know more about his wife and why she's putting up with this. I mean, I have some well, idea. Well, she wasn't. She cursed the fucking woman. <laughs> Well, that's the only time she wasn't to a point where she brought the supernatural into reality again. <laughs> that's the only time we see her reacting. We really, really don't know her at all. She has barely any lines. We really don't get any idea of what she developed, what what develops, and what's her character about. I don't know. I just, I really am, and and as as I said in in the history section. Cousin marriages is a thing, a thing in this country, thing there. It was a huge thing in the 80s. I don't know if it's still so uh, among Pakistani fans. I suspect it still is. Having said that, I still think it should have been examined more. It's just passively. I mean, no, if you if they didn't say cousin, you would just think these are all friends or, or this is a business partner trying to marry off another business partner's a child. Mm -hmm. I don't think they say cousin. Yeah, I don't think they say the word cousin either. It's just, well, they say aunt, and this is his... This is your son. This is my daughter. They're going to get married. <laughs> you don't have to say cousin for me to get that. <laughs> Somebody should be bothered by this. At least a little bit. Agreed. Just a teeny bit. You're like, is this really what we want? Anyway, no, it doesn't work. I, I did not I did not like this at all. And we are such Philistines because this is seen as a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece of something. <laughs> what's next? What, what's the next thing we're going to say? And destroy and hate. <laughs> Well, speaking of, speaking of destruction, the next next fucking movie on her our list is Patton. Patton from nineteen seventy. <laughs> Not Oswald. Not Patton Oswald. No. No, <laughs> that's a shame. Uh, have you seen Patton? Nope. I have only seen clips of, so I've never actually seen this whole thing. I'm aware of the concept of tank warfare, so hmm. that's what I'm expecting. I remember the Mad Magazine parody of. Patton, which I remember being very funny. I don't think the movie is funny. <laughs> I don't think it's a comedy. I know this is Richard, one of Richard Nixon's favorite films, so that's a strike against it. <laughs> Fair. But we'll see. Maybe it's very good. I don't know. All right, George, I'm about to say goodnight to you for some reason. Thank you for joining <laughs> us, but I should be saying that to the audience and not to you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Please write. Please let us know what we can do and what we can't do. Would you like to see more of what you see less of? That's it. That's all I got. So I guess that's it for this episode. I'm Joe Dixon. Thanks for listening. And I'm George Romacca. Thanks for listening indeed, because if a podcast drops and there's no one around to hear it, it's just another collection of ones and zeros that doesn't matter. I presume my brother, the boy's papa, was out screwing some barmaid somewhere. So when these tappings went on, I got out of bed and went to the balcony and opened the door. And there was my brother, you know, standing outside with some woman. And they were completely without clothes. Blue with gold, like two bars of soap. This I refer to as my brother's blue period. But what happened to the woman? He married her. You've been listening to Does This Still Work? Produced by Joe Dixon and George Ramaka. The hosts can be reached via social media, email, or the contact page at dtswpod.com. Be good to yourself and others, because that still works. No, I've
obviously. If you own a restaurant, you probably don't have a fridge. And, no, obviously. If you own a restaurant, you probably don't have a fridge or your house. God, no, stop, obviously. stop, 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 stop. I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. No, 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 no change your thing, no change it. I can do it, I can do it. Boom. Why do you suppose conservatives who say they like something act shock that's liberal? What is your go-to dish when you have to make dinner? I saw an interview where Jane Fonda debunked the idea of not making new friends after you're 50. What do you think? All right, what is your favorite board game? What music of your parents growing up did you hear, did you enjoy it, and do you enjoy it today?